So we are on air. <laughs> we can continue. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was so great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elham Puryamer. I'm an independent curator and the curatorial team leader of the Live Assembly Repair and Care, the program of Live Biennale this year. I live in Vancouver, and I respectfully acknowledge that. We live and work on the unceded and occupied ancestral and traditional lands of Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of Masquiam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I'm so thankful that today we have Paul Collier, Peter Murray, and Juan Bernie Dansker. Thank you so much. Juan also was uh, one of our um, community, uh, advisory community members. They have had many meetings before the assembly and she generously shared her thoughts and um, also her knowledge and experiences with us. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna introduce the moderator of the program today, Brian Postalian. Brian is an art administrator, educator, and creator, born and raised in Toronto by way of Armenia, Ireland, Wales, and the Czech Republic. As a founding uh, artistic director of Recurrent Theatre, Brian creates collaborative performances in immersive and interact in interactive frameworks that reimagine gathering. Brian's work has, has been um, featured on, on best of the year list, receive outstanding direction, Now Magazine, Best Production, Summer Works 2017, nomination for outstanding direction, My Entertainment Work. Great brain. His recent projects engage in um, game theory and emergent through audience design. Brian is a sessional instructor within the theater department at X University in the fall and has been a guest lecturer at the University of Toronto and Simon Fraser University. He completed a Master of Fine Art Arts at Simon Fraser University for the Contemporary Arts in Theatre Game Design and Interdisciplinary Performance Studies. In his spare time, he likes to visit used books, bookstores, visit and childhood video games, ride his bicycle, play with his dog Amy, and is learning how to draw and play the Armenian video. Brian currently lives on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Squamish, Salwatid, and Masquam nations. From now on, Brian is taking over. Thank you. Thank you, Elham. Um, I've had learning how to draw in my bio for several years, and it's more of a reminder than it is perhaps an active practice. <laughs> Just to be totally transparent in the uh, you know the themes of the assembly. Um, Hi everyone, I'm so pleased to be holding space today with these three artists, curators, educators, administrators. Um, over the past three days at the assembly, uh, we've been considering these concepts of repair and care, self-reflection as self and as institution, how we care for artists, and thinking about creative administration um, and multiple rather than singular frameworks. It's moved us to thinking about positionality with, with artists as part of or instigator of community as we continue to consider how does one define performance as social work, craft, employment, hard labor, bodily nourishment, creative thought. Our conversations um, have come back to pressing concerns around justice, equity, diverse and diversity, and inclusion, and how the body is situated with, against, alongside, or squashed by institutions. This afternoon, we've been tasked with uh, asking and responding to the question, how will tomorrow be different? How will tomorrow be different? How will tomorrow? be different. So to respond to this uh, not so daunting question, we're going to begin with Paul Couillard, who has been diligently writing his speech all the while leading up to this talk. Uh, Paul is a queer artist, curator, and performance arts scholar as a founding co-curator of the 7A11D International Festival of Performance Art and recently completed his doctorate uh, in rethinking presence with a thinking body 
interactive relationality in animate form. Paul offers a mediation on presence from the perspective of a thinking body, integrating insights from a continental philosophy, popular neuroscience, and interactive performance art practices. Having crafted numerous and sometimes contradictory narratives of what he thinks performance art is, today he's going to propose a field guide of producing performance art festivals. Paul, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, so, we generally start with land acknowledgements. So, I just want to acknowledge that uh, I'm in Toronto or to Toronto as it's also called, which is traditionally the territory of the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples and is covered by the Treaty 13 Mississaugas of the Credit, um, with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I also wanted to talk briefly about my own, uh, to position my own background in terms of a land acknowledgement. And that's something that I actually learned from, from uh, Peter uh, a couple of years ago, the last 7A11D festival. Um, he and Naomi Goto um, kind of re, imagined or expanded on the idea of land uh, acknowledgements in a, in a beautiful performance that they did that I've just put the link up for in the chat. Um, and one of the things they talked about was how it's, it's as much about positioning yourself in the land as, as acknowledging uh, the others who are the traditional stewards and caretakers of that land. So, so I felt I wanted to acknowledge that um, my family on my father's side has been in this land, originally in Quebec, since the early 1600s. Um, and I have an ancestor who's, who's Guillaume Cuillard, whose great claim to fame is that he was the first European to use a plow to plow the North American soil. And when I was a child, I had no idea why this would be an important thing growing up in a very urban environment. But as I've thought about it since and as it's resonated, I've realized what a profound act and not necessarily all to the good that is in terms of a, a, an assertion of um, a way of being with the land. So, so I live with that and I live with that ancestry. Um, on my mother, and so my ancestry and my father's side is all Irish and French. Um, and on my mother's side, I'm a fifth generation immigrant uh, and with a background of German, Russian, Mennonite and Jewish heritage. Um, they were farmers. Um, but all of these heritages, my French heritage, because I did not grow up speaking French at home, uh, my Jewish heritage, which is really more rumor than, than a known thing, um, my Mennonite heritage, because my great grandfather refused the Mennonite church, et cetera, et cetera. I realize all of these heritages are in a way lost to me, but I also recognize that I'm in a, in a space of privilege in that um, even though they have been lost through the accidents of my family history, um, they're still much more available to me as a history that I can dig into and find if I need to than, than, than many of the, uh, you know, Indigenous peoples whose whose heritage was not not just lost but stolen from them, taken from them. Um, I think a lot about. Uh, we were asked, in a sense, by by Brian to position ourselves. So, I understand very much that I that I I sit in a position of privilege, but at the same time, I've always felt like a misfit within within this culture. And, and it gets a little overwhelming sometimes to think, wow, even with all of my privilege to feel so misfit and woe begotten within this culture, uh, I, I, I can't begin to imagine how it must feel like for many others who have less uh, privilege to begin with. So, um, so with that, I, I wanted to thank everybody who uh, we've heard speak up to this point for their amazing teachings. Um, I'm going to actually piggyback on a, on a line from Peter and say, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. 
Um, so forgive me if I uh, seem a bit nervous or stumble a bit. Um, so as uh, Brian mentioned, I proposed when we were talking about what we might do to, to produce something that I was thinking of as a field guide. So uh, Brian, you can actually uh, bring that slideshow up now if you want. So, so uh, what this field guide is, is as, as I've been sitting in the conference and in the week or two weeks leading up to the conference, as I was thinking about what I would say, um, I began to write down terms that struck me that had a relationship. I, I'm thinking of the field guide in terms of a field guide of the different types of festivals. I've been to a lot of different festivals over the years. Um, and so I've, I've amassed these terms. They're all either verbs or, or sorry, nouns or gerunds. Um, I didn't use any. So even though some of them may appear to be descriptor terms, uh, qualities as opposed to things, I, I only chose things that could be a kind of thing, just partly as a way to narrow things down, but are, partly because I'm thinking about what is a festival, what is a festival can be, and but also, and this may sound weird to some people, who is a festival? Uh, because I think every festival has a personality and, and uh, um, you know, we tend to forget that these things that we think of as instruments also are actants in their own ways, also have a life of their own, also have a dynamic and a force of their own. And, and you know, in philosophy, it's a big thing, whether you're a what or a who. And although I don't necessarily propose that you would approach a festival as a who in the same way that you would approach uh, your friend as a who, uh, I think to think of things as who's as opposed to the way we tend to go in this world, which is to think of people more, more and more other people as things, I think is a kind of pushback or a different way of kind of thinking about what those things are. So um, uh, you may find yourself profoundly allergic to some of these terms that I've, that I've gathered of what a festival could be. Some of them are too colonious, too capitalist, too narrow, too broad, too well, too ist, <laughs> some way, kind or another. But it's interesting how the and it's how some of these things uh, are temporal metaphors. Some of them are spatial metaphors. Some of them are material metaphors. Some of them are energetic, energic metaphors about dynamics or force or movement. Um, and the other thing about these terms is that, as we reminded in the very first panel, we should think about adding an S to every one of these terms. Uh, so not a knowledge, but knowledge as. Are, and also a whole plethora of suffixes, un, anti, counter, contra, de, dis, meta, para, poly, re, super, trans, under, etc., etc. Um, so, uh, so that in a way uh, is is one of my attempts to make a contribution to this conversation. Um, I wanted to acknowledge there, there were really um, four questions that Brian has asked us as we were uh, organizing the panel. One of them is, and Brian, I'm going to share them whether you wanted us to or not. One of them is, when you think of the center and margins, what does that mean? Or how has that played out in your own practice? Uh, the second question is, how are you situated as an individual or as part of an institution? And what is your modus operandi? The third question is, what are the seeds for tomorrow and what are the actions of today? And I would add a fourth, or, or, sorry, and then a fourth question he added later was, uh, how do we remember what never happened to us? Thinking about everything that's been unfolding in the conference and how sometimes we inherit these uh, festivals, uh, we become the caretakers of them, and yet, and so we're responsible for a whole institutional history that we may not even know. So how do we remember what may have never happened to us? And I would add to that based on the conversations over the last couple of days, one more question. Uh, and really, I only have questions, no answers, is where or what are the resources of the future? So we were asked on the first or we were it was suggested on the first day that 
before we could begin to decenter ourselves, we had to position ourselves. And Chris, Great and Kelly, uh, one of the things he offered as a way of positioning himself was a, a visual description, um, which is a tool that comes very much from the uh, uh, for the disabled community, for someone who has uh, has uh, uh, visibility issues. Um, to describe yourself visually is is a way to uh, to offer a kind of a resource, you know, a way of a way of um, providing an access. Um, so, uh, what happens with these tools? But I don't know how many visually impaired people there are here, or how useful that would be. And if I were going to describe myself, I would not begin from the visual. I, I actually, although we are visual artists, I don't particularly consider myself a visual person. I'm more a tactile kinesthetic person. Um, so I would start with a different set of descriptions than the visual probably. Um, but this, this visual description is something, is, is an appropriated tool in some ways. Um, and so I'm, I'm really thinking about resources and access and, and a, a, as real issues going forward into the future. Um, there was a moment in the first day when we, when we all went to the, uh, to the verb Frau room to, uh, to, uh, join with Margaret. Um, and I had my cursor on Francisco's avatar. So I was whispering to him, so I couldn't hear Margaret, but I didn't understand what was going on in that moment. Um, so that was a resource that I was misusing. And so, but what happened was a beautiful moment where Leanne uh, started typing in the things that Margaret was saying, because I said, oh, I can't hear her. And so this was a kind of um, offering of resource, offering of access, uh, which to be honest was, was, uh, touched me deeply, but I could not really take full advantage of because I was too freaked out in the moment <laughs> and not able to kind of follow. Um, and I did eventually figure out how to get my cursor off. But but these offerings, I think, are, are really important in terms of thinking about uh, access, who has access, how do we have access, when do we have access, who do we want to have access. Um, you know, uh, the, the question of resources for me, you know, as a performance artist, my resources are usually like a gaffer tape and a light bulb. <laughs> is you know, I, I tend to um, issue anything that's too technological. Um, we also often offer offer things or ways of talking. You know, it's been a very, I would say, scholarly conversation. Much of much of what's what's been spoken comes very much from an academic uh, perspective over these past several days. Um, and and I, I felt I needed to acknowledge that even though I'm somewhat versed in that language, uh, I'm not sure everyone is. And I'm not sure, um, you know, we, we talk so much about, about access and empowerment, but often the discourse the language we use to talk about those things can be disempowering and and can be uh, can can limit access and and we're not even we're in ways we're often not even conscious of i'll, I'll give you an example um brian mentioned that i'm one of the co-founders and co-curators of the 7a11d international festival of performance art um 7a 11D is spelled 7A asterisk 11D, and the asterisk is silent. And it's for us, it rep for some of us anyways, it represents all the unspoken, all the, all the excess, all the extra, all that something that can't be said aloud or, or can't be named. Um, but as we've been going through a process of trying to make our website more accessible, one of the things I was putting on in terms of captions is 7A asterisk 11D festival uh, as acknowledging where an image is from. And then I, and then I realized, well, what does a, what does a reader do with that? If, if you have a technological reader that's reading the words off the page for somebody who's uh, visually impaired, how does it read that asterisk? 
and and does then does that then become something that is untranslatable or or um, incomprehensible to somebody uh, who doesn't come from the same background? So so the these issues of resources and 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 uh, create you know, uh, um, Sissy su suggested there are possibilities for creative administration that that can address some of these issues. Um, they're, uh, for me, they're less straightforward when we get to the practical level sometimes. So the brief for this day of discussions focuses on envisioning new models of governance and considering what a different live Biennale might be um, or what a different festival generally might be. Um, in my three plus decades as a performance art creator, curator and theorizer, as Brian mentioned, I've crafted numerous and sometimes contradictory narratives of what I think performance art is and why it's important and how it should be done. And today I'm trying to reframe that, what I've learned as a kind of uh, uh, brief field guide, or that was my original intention in a talk that I had titled Emergent Histories, Unlikely Catalysts, Best Practices, Notes Toward Possible Futures in Memory of Tara Ito. I'm not sure this is still that same talk, that I started out to undertake, but but there it is as a title. Um, my first response is in thinking about you know uh, what what tomorrow might look like is I I don't I don't think we're even at a point to be able to fully articulate how today is different, let alone how tomorrow will be different. Uh, certainly, we or at least I haven't caught up with that difference that's been brought to us over, for example, as a result of the pandemic. Um, but I do believe that some things will still be the same. And, and you know, I hope we'll still be human in all our contrariness. <laughs> I'm certain we'll still need nourishment, uh, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. And um, we still need and crave connection and community. So we'll need each other and we'll need ourselves. Um, I suppose the question is really, what will we need to be doing to safeguard those things as we move forward? Um, so going back to my uh, somewhat abandoned title, Emergent Histories, Unlikely Catalysts, Best Practices, Notes Toward Possible Futures in Memory of Tari Ito. Oops. Uh, I'll get there. <laughs> um, just trying to do something in the background here. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about why I came up with that title, which probably will take me to the end of my talk just to get there. Um, first, I wanted to dedicate this talk to Tari Ito because I, I know that uh, she was at the last live festival and, and had an important place there. She died recently. Um, I and I wrote a uh, a um, memorial to her, which I'm putting up the link there. Uh, which, but Tari is is one of those uh, happy accidents or unlikely catalysts uh, for Photo Performance Inc., which was a which is a artist run center for performance art that started off as a very loose ad hoc collective that I was one of the founders of and also in a way for the 7A11D festival, um, just by her presence in Toronto. She happened to be in Toronto at, at a particular point and, and Sandy McFadden and other performance artists came to me and said, this great international artist is in town. We really should organize something for her. We should organize an event. And that became the photo, collect the photo collective, which eventually became an artist run center for performance art. Um, so we never know when, where those catalysts are going to come from. Um, uh, and often they're unlikely, often they're things we're struggling against, often um, the catalysts for the wondrous things we have are shortages of funds, um, correctives against regionalization, uh, the need for a national infrastructure, um, you know, when we started photo in the 90s people were people thought that uh you know performance art was dead that it was a historical form and you know 
in in bringing it back suddenly suddenly you know performance burst back onto the scene in a in, in an important way because it was an important response to the times um the catalyst can be a reaction to big tech so we have any number of crazy catalysts right now in terms of covid in turn for for live in particular a change of staff um which may or may not be a change of or or uh connect to a change of governance. Um, um, we have a huge political and social uncertainty. So um, it's often these these negative things that are <laughs> that end up being the catalyst for positive change. Uh, I also wanted to um, to highlight the idea of emergent histories because when we revisit the past, um, we often discover entirely new things that were always there or at least were there as potentialities. Um, uh, it's interesting how often we, we privilege presence, but presence is dynamic, presence is constantly changing. And, and what we discover was present through current presence is, is uh, very, very important to, uh, to uh, the ability for presence to move. Um, emergent histories as a, as a term also um, talks about understanding today as history making in itself, that we're doing by doing, that we're activists, that, um, that this, what we're doing right now, being, being here together assembled virtually, is history in the making itself. Uh, is emergent history. Um, and then I use that rather um, grandiose term, best practices. Um, it's kind of, um, to think about all, you know, when I go to different events, when I attend events as a participant, as an audience, as a, as when I'm involved in them as an organizer, I'm always thinking about this question of best practices of what did we do well? What did we do badly? What could we do better? Um, and I think that's one of the real questions that we're asking in terms of, you know, uh, what will tomorrow be like uh, is also what, what, what could tomorrow be like and what do we want tomorrow to be like? Um, of course, best practices change. I mean, there are certain things around treatment of artists that have been discussed in some of the panels, um, ways of connecting with audiences, um, contextualizing events, how we develop audiences, how we respond to audiences, um, who our audience is. So, you know, one of the things about all those terms in that endlessly scrolling field guide or beginning of a field guide um, is that all of them are relational. No, no term, just as no festival, no thing sits as a as a completely self-contained thing in itself. Uh, a thing in itself is all of the possible ways in which a thing is able to connect with any other thing or any world or any surrounding around it. Um, so, uh, um, so the inflection of these terms is about different kinds of relationality. So for example, if live is wondering what should it be tomorrow? Well, the question is in relation to who? In relation to your funders, in relation to your audiences, in relation to the audiences you want to support? Do you, do you see yourself as sitting in a network of artist run centers? Do you see yourself in a regional dialogue? Do you see yourself as, as part of the culture of a particular city? Do you see yourself as speaking to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, an international um, confluence of theory? Um, and, you know, will we have some clues about where uh, live may see itself situated by the people who've been invited to this conference and who are who have the, the, the humbling privilege of, of being able to speak um, 
Uh, do you see yourself in terms of a national conversation, an international conversation, an art world conversation, a social justice conversation uh, in regard to political aspirations, as an inspiration for local artists, as, you know, um, uh, as, as an initiator of, of, of particular practices? There's, there's, to begin to answer what will tomorrow be like, one needs to first think in relation to what. Um, and that's one of the reasons I come back to this, this question of, of resources. Um, uh, I, it's interesting. I've been really struggling with the OEA um, platform. <laughs> as as a place of holding this conversation. It's fantastic to be able to uh, engage with speakers from around the world. Um, it's also very intimidating and and this is not in any way a criticism of the incredible work that has been done to uh, to shape this platform for this conference. Um, but there's a lot of hierarchy built into it, for example. I mean, I don't feel that intimidated being here as a speaker in this very privileged position in the big, big box here right now. But I felt incredibly nervous. I mean, my heart was racing when I had to go into this, when I had had to, when I chose to, partly in order just to see what it was like, go into the speaker's box yesterday to ask a question. Um, that was a really intimidating place for me to go into and kind of ask my question and then, you know, I wanted to do follow up, but the time was short and it felt like, oh, this isn't appropriate. So I kind of slunk away. I, you know, I clicked leave the box, you know, rather than, rather than keep interjecting. Um, and, and that's a function of the platform and a function of access and, and how, how we have these conversations. And, you know, we only learn that in some ways by having the experience sometimes. Sometimes we have to have bad, <laughs> bad or, or, or unsettling experiences in order to discover, uh, you know, what what we may be uh, struggling with, and what remains <coughs> unarticulated for us. Um, excuse me. <coughs> I'm going to take a moment of silence just because that water went down the wrong way. Um, So when I imagined this conversation, when I imagined me being here speaking, um, I imagine I started to unpack my own personal lore of, of uh, who I am, how I got to be here, all of the festivals I've visited, all of the wonderful experiences I've had, all of the terrible experiences I've had, all of the connections I've made, all of the missed connections, all of the, the uh, re-up later connections where you discover, oh, you were at that festival and I, I don't think I even realized that at the time. You know, some of, some of those kinds of things um, that have happened to me over the course of being a performance artist over the past two, two many decades. <laughs> Um, but it seems like rather than, rather than go too far into any of those stories now, because they feel like they don't have a context, they might be stories that come up more usefully, uh, in conversation. Um, one of the things I'm feeling is, is for me, there's a real, uh, deadness of the air in my office because I can't hear all of you. Uh, you know, I only, I only hear my voice. Uh, and so even though I can see that you're all out there and I see the platform, um, you know, that, that in itself is, is, a is a, and I see your hands. Thank you. Um, that in itself is, uh, very weird for someone who's a performance artist. I joke that 
I became a performance artist because um, I'm very intimidated by crowds. And I thought, well, there's a profession where I can be more or less guaranteed there'll never be more than 40 people in the room. Um, but it's important to have those 40 people. I mean, it's important to breathe that same water. It's important to, to you know, smell their sweat and, and, and feel the sweatiness or the coldness or the, the you know, the, the tenor, the atmosphere of the room. And um, wow, is it, is it ever difficult to hold on to that for me in this virtual platform? So certainly, I don't think we want, we, you know, there was that phrase yesterday, I think it was throwing, or maybe it was the first thing, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I don't want to do that, uh, but I hope uh, our events don't become only um, only te technological, only virtual events. Um, one of the the pandemic, in a in a funny way, reveals to us the power of connection, the power of the lack of borders. Actually, that separates us in many ways because uh, we are so vulnerable to each other. Um, uh, you know, we are leaky borders. And so one of one of the things I'm offering in, in terms of saying all of these words could be what the festival is, not just a component of a festival or who comes to a festival or what's inside a festival. Any of these words could be a word for the festival itself. Because, and, and I say, no, the festival is a who because we make up the festival, but the festival also is bigger than us, and the festival also comes into us. Um, and, and has it, we believe we have some domain over ourselves, and you know, that we can, that we can manage our own comportment, that we can take responsibility as individuals. And that's certainly true, and certainly necessary. But I think we also need to acknowledge that the festival is also a thing of its own that has other ways of taking responsibility for itself and for uh, asserting its own domain. Um, a who-ness that we can't fully control even as we contribute. Um, which perhaps doesn't sound very close to the question of uh, what will tomorrow be like. Um, but that's an unanswerable question. I mean, what, uh, the only way I have of answering what will tomorrow be like is, is, is to think about what, what is today like, a question that, as I said, is already somewhat unanswerable, and what, has, what have all the yesterdays been like? And the, to me, one of the most interesting things about the yesterdays is, is, as I said, now I'm starting to just repeat myself, is that uh, as an emergent history, uh, yesterday turns out not to be what I thought it was when, I, when it was today, sometimes. Um, so, I don't know, um, Ryan, perhaps there's a way this, this uh, field guide is going to scroll out for a little bit longer. We're only up to the T's. But I feel like I would like to um, make this a little more open. I'm tired of hearing my own voice uh, for the moment. I, I want to be in dialogue, so I don't know if there's a way to continue this openly just as those last few words roll out. Question? Totally possible. So uh, that's an invitation, although we're up to be used, so it's really not going to be more than a few seconds. Since I haven't encountered any X's or Y's, although perhaps I would add yesterday that list based on my own conversation.
the other thing I'll just mention, uh, since no one's speaking, uh, this is a curl feather, which was given to me by a Hasu Mastig in his school, um, who is one of the dear loves of my life. Uh, and he was mentioned in the talk he annotated in earlier, uh, with Peter and Dina were a part of. Um, and and it's it's part of a kind of construction I've made. One of one of the very few art pieces I've actually made. It's applied to uh, one of my years. Um, in a in a performance that I had, I I, I called sitting with the mountain. I took this feather outside and had it on a blanket, and I had someone help me throw it up into the air, thinking I could get rid of it, and I couldn't. Uh, I had to go collect it afterwards, but what I did do was bind it in thread, because I, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't let go of that connection to Ahasu. So, um, so I know that there's a tradition, not my tradition, but there is a tradition of holding a feather when one wants to speak truth. And so, I saw it there today, and I thought I needed to hold this to give me courage while I was speaking today. So I just wanted to share that as, as a kind of unlikely catalyst in emerging history. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you for your courage, your frankness, and um, your your presence. Always hard to, to do what it is that we do and what you did. So thank you. And um, I guess, uh, uh, yes, claps, claps. Um, both, <laughs> both a, an, an apology and a sense of gratitude for coming forward with perhaps the difficulties that you've already faced in the assembly itself. And even what the kind of makes me think about these new vocabularies of technology um, and the vocabularies of performance are how the two both feel very intricately and tied, especially if you're new to either of those communities. Um, what can I do? What am I supposed to do? Am I doing this right? Am I supposed to be clapping at the end? Like all of those feel really tied up in, um, in everything. And so, uh, thank you for coming forward. It all it all ties back to itself, really. Um, and we'll come back to some of these points uh, once we go to Joanne. And mm -hmm. um, Joanne is a curator and the former director and chief executive officer of the Biennial of Sydney, Vancouver Art Gallery, Museum Villa Struck Munich, and Fry Art Museum Seattle. Joanne provokes that tomorrow will not be different unless cultural organizations can move beyond the systems, fictions, and cultural institutional apartheids of the Western canon to fully embrace knowledge that is deeply embedded in culture, place, country, language, protocols, and fundamentally different systems of classification. Over to you, Joanne. Thank you. So, thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of the live assembly, and I, I mean that most sincerely. Um, I'm very grateful, and I'm especially grateful to live and work on the magnificent unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I want to pay, take this opportunity to pay my respect to the traditional custodians of the land their chiefs, their matriarchs, and elders, past, present, and emerging. And Brian, you asked us to introduce ourselves a little bit. So I was born on the other side of the great ocean, on the stunning unceded territory of the Turbo people, in a place called Mianjin, which is today known as Brisbane. I grew up in Kuparu the turtle word for dove. And as a child, I would visit my grandparents in Tawong, the turtle word for rainbow. As a special treat, we would drive 
to the observation deck on Mount Putha overlooking the city. And this is where the Turbul people would collect kutar, which is honey from the native stingless bee. My family would watch Aussie rules football in Wollongabba, the Turbul word for fight, talk, place. And I went to university in Indrapilli, the Turbul word for a gully of running water. I lived on country of the Turbul and Jagera peoples as a child and a young adult, but I knew nothing of the Aboriginal people of Mianjin or their language or the powerful rich meanings of the names of those places which had played such an important part in my own life. I grew up in an unacknowledged and violent apartheid, a state of being apart, with generations of stolen children, forbidden languages and no legal rights for Aboriginal people who couldn't vote in state elections until 1965. And it was not until 1967 that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were included in the census. On their website, the Turbul tribe writes, today there are under 50 surviving members of the Turbul tribe. We were previously a tribe of 3,000 plus before the widespread massacres. And we, the modern day Turbuls, are reserve Aboriginals and have never signed away our Aboriginality. We are extremely fortunate, they write, to have had our Turbul language documented in the 1850s and to therefore still have it intact today. We were asked to discuss today, as Brian pointed out, how tomorrow will be different and as you mentioned, Brian, I believe that tomorrow will not be different unless cultural organisations, large and small, including live, move beyond what you listed, the apartheids, the language, the fictions, the structures of governance, the hierarchies and the classifications of the so-called Western canon. And not only move beyond, but fully embrace knowledge that is deeply embedded in place, country, language, culture, protocols, and as, as you said, Brian, fundamentally different values. And at a time when First Nation communities in British Columbia and across Canada are mourning their missing children in unmarked graves, there is no responsibility more urgent. And unfortunately, this is not a new plea. More than 30 years ago, in a 1988 interview titled The Struggle Against Cultural Apartheid, published in News, Anishabe Salto First Nations artist and curator Robert Hull quoted the 1982 Applebaum Hebert Commission Report on Canada's federal cultural policy. And I quote, the unfortunate and unnecessary con connotation that works of contemporary native art are understood best as artifacts and are somehow neither contemporary nor art. In such a context, Hull commented, the museum can only be thought of as a reservation guided by cultural apartheid. In 1990, I contributed an essay titled Organizational Apartheid to Third Text, one of the series of papers and articles I published around that time. And I wrote that cultural segregation is such a fundamental aspect of Western society and its justification so entrenched in our vocabulary and institutions, it's become almost invisible. The terminology of control is ethnic, native, minority, amateur, and quality. And how can we, as members of the cultural community in Canada, break down the barriers that have been elected around our cultural institutions and what's required in our institutional and organizational structures that make it possible? 
In January 1991, Haida artist Chief Gitzler, Ronald Wilson, made a presentation to the Constitutional Commission called the Citizens Forum on Canada's Future in Gore and Old Masset on Heidi Gwai. He said, we learned your system. Now it's your turn. Take time, learn, listen. We have things that help. Do not be dead ears. I wondered, as he spoke, if the cultural community that I was a part of would ever be willing to abandon its power, funding, language, and mechanisms of control. I recalled my very first curatorial project as a baby curator at the Vancouver Art Gallery a decade earlier. It was called Robert Flaherty, Photographer, Filmmaker, The Inuit, 1910 to 22. The Flaherty Project was an interdisciplinary archive-based endeavor comprising three exhibitions and a reader that were presented in different constellations in Vancouver, New York, Thunder Bay, and Nunavik in Northern Quebec between December 1979 and January 1981. The first exhibition presented Nanak of the North, 1922, shot in Nunavik by the legendary filmmaker Robert Flaherty, and photographs taken by Flaherty between 1910 and 22 in the Canadian Arctic. The second companion exhibition, called Inuit TV, was a collaboration with renowned Inuk leader Tagak Curley. It presented videos produced by Inuit filmmakers in the Inuktitut language that had been broadcast across the Arctic in 1979 via a newly launched Anik B satellite. The third exhibition was another collaboration, this time with the FCNQ, the Federation of, of Cooperatives in uh, Nunavik in North Quebec, which toured Flaherty's photographs and Nanak of the North to 10 very remote Inuit communities in Nunavik in the depths of winter in 1980 and 81. That, through that particular exhibition, Flaherty's photographs were returned to the communities that he had visited and to the families of the Inuit who had worked on and contributed to the film Nanak of the North. It was also our hope that their descendants would be able to identify who was who had been photographed by Flaherty. And the fourth and final platform of the project was the reader, and it included a text by renowned Inuk artist, photographer, and historian Peter Pitzila, who met Flaherty by chance on Baffin Island in 1913 and 1914. It included essays, chronology, archive materials diary excerpts and reconstructions, narratives, narrative reconstructions of earlier lost films made by Flaherty in both Nunavut and Nunavik. The reader revealed a radically different portrait of, Fla of, in, of the Inuit than had been depicted in the film, Manic of the North. To the astonishment of the then Vancouver Art Gallery director, Luke Rombard and myself, our application for funding to realize the Flaherty Project was refused outright, not a penny, by the National Museums of Canada. The VAG was informed that while the project had merit, it could not be given, quote, priority consideration as it was, quote, not of major significance within the context of the National Museums of Canada's mandate. In a public review, Luke Rombaut used his word and his foreword in the reader to chastise the National Museums for refusing to fund the project and also noted that requests for funds to translate the reader into a nuktitut for the communities in the north and in French had also been rejected by both the Secretary of State, Language Programs and the Ministry of Cultural Affairs of the Government of Quebec. 
And the question we kept asking was why? We came to the conclusion that we were refused all funding because the Flaherty project was deemed to be ethnographic rather than art and therefore did not qualify as a priority for either funding or, in the opinion of the government funders, presentation in an art museum. Before I continue, I have to acknowledge those people who did make the project possible, and there were amazing colleagues at the National Photography, what used to be the National Photography Collection of the Public Archives of Canada, and the Cultural and Linguistic Section of the then Department of Indian and Northern Affairs, which translated a small portion of the reader. 20 years after the Flaherty Project, in 2001, one of the leading curators and theoreticians of the 21st century, Oakley and Wazel, described the distinction between curating within the canon and curating within culture. And curating within the canon, he said, means to curate facing the formidable examples that have been produced in the West. To curate within culture, he said, is to see art in a totality that is not simply bound by art history. It's there, he argued, that we begin to make room for new forms of knowledge new possibilities of articulating different types of intelligence that are unruly and that cannot be disciplined by the academic world. This means that often the curator, he said, needs to be experimental and the intellectual biography of the curator has to be on shaky ground. The question, Brian, your question, is today different? Many believe that today is different. The representation of First Nation artists in museums and biennials such as live has increased greatly, especially in recent years. And indigenous curators have been appointed to senior positions in museums, public art galleries and artist run centers. But as Dave noted this morning, are we seeing only the appearance of representation? In 2017, Governor General Awardee and Curator Leanne Martin from the Tyndanaga Mohawk Territory published an essay called Anger and Reconciliation, a very brief history of exhibiting contemporary Indigenous art in Canada in After All. She spoke of the categorization of Indigenous art art practices in ethnographic terms and quote, how these conditions in 2017 are largely still the case. She concluded her essay by saying, I remain angry and frustrated. Indigenous arts, arts professionals throughout Canada and the world have developed a formidable intellectual force that challenges the basic premise of Western mandates and practices. The drastic conditions still exist throughout Canada, evidence of the persistence of the country's colonial history and its lingering effects today. Thousands of missing, missing and murdered women, high rates of suicide among our youth, the incarceration of indigenous men, poverty, lack of drinking water, and educational needs plague our communities, not to mention the constant struggle for sovereignty over traditional lands. In July 2017, around the same time that Leanne Martin's essay was published, I arrived in Sydney to take up the position of Director and CEO of the Biennale in Sydney. I had prearranged that my first meeting would be lunch overlooking Sydney Harbour to pay my respects to two remarkable elders of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, Uncle Alan Madden and his brother, Uncle Charles or Chica Madden, on whose country I would be working. It was the Gadigal people 
whom Captain James Cook encountered when he landed in Australia. The Gadigal are people of first contact, and like the Turbo, the nation that bore the brunt of colonial violence, as the country now known as Sydney, was seized and its people, euphemistically speaking, were dispersed. When I arrived on time for lunch, Uncle Alan and Uncle Chicka were comfortably ensconced in the restaurant waiting for me. As I sat down, Uncle Chicka turned to me and asked if the Board of Trustees of the Biennale of Sydney knew that I was meeting with them. And when I said no, but I'm sure they'd be very pleased to know that we met, he said, perhaps we should meet after you've told me. I tried to recover the moment. I said, well, we can certainly do that if, if you prefer, but wouldn't you like to have lunch anyway? Uncle Chica replied, Joanne, we're tired of talking and nothing coming of it. Our brightest and our best have just received their doctoral degrees, but we don't know if they will find paid permanent positions. We are tired of our children being hired for positions tied to grants. And as soon as the grants run out, they are laid off. We are tired of our children being constantly in training. We want our brightest and our best to be hired for permanent paid positions of responsibility that match their training and their ability. And when you have permanent positions not tied to grants and not low paid token positions, but responsible leadership positions, then we can talk. I said I would come back to them once this had been accomplished, but for today could we eat together? And they said yes, and we had a wonderful, memorable lunch. A year later, in July 2018, Wiradjuri artist Brooke Andrew was appointed Artistic Director of the 2020 Biennale of Sydney, the first time in the 50-year history of the Biennale of Sydney that an Aboriginal curator was appointed to the role. This was followed by two other key appointments, the curatorial assistant to the Artistic Director and coordinator of the programs and learning. And in March 2020, Niran, the landmark artist and Indigenous-led 22nd Biennale of Sydney, opened to international acclaim. Tomorrow can be different if we are not dead ears, if we embrace knowledge that is deeply embedded in country, place, language, culture, protocols, and fundamentally different values. If we curate within culture and see art in a totality that is not simply bounded by art history, if we make room for new forms of knowledge, new possibilities of articulating different types of intelligence that are unruly and can't be disciplined, if we are willing to be on shaky ground, if we embrace formidable intellectual forces that challenge the basic premise of Western mandates and practice. If we place our deepest held certainties about the meaning and value of our work in question. If we share power or abandon it. If we share funding or gift it. If we share or abandon leadership and key paid positions, and if we abandon the language and mechanisms of control. Thank you.
you, Joanne. Yeah, wow. Thank you. I'm just going to sit with that for... Thank you again. Yeah, well, well uh, applauded. Um, no pressure to Peter to follow up. <laughs> um, a brief intro uh, for Peter, who has exhibited work all over Canada. Um, that's been informed by dreams, ancestors, family members, and performance art as a research methodology. Peter is a current tenured faculty at the Ontario College of Art and Design University, and he's going to share his focus on implementing Indigenous methodologies to build community and acknowledge Indigenous art history, and how a performance art pedagogy helps create opportunities for the bodies in the room to consider their re relationship to knowledge and how they want to use that knowledge to support their life ways. Welcome, Peter. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Paul and Joanne. Um, it's very beautiful offerings today. And um, uh, I, I feel overwhelmed. <laughs> and I, I, there's a few things uh, before I, before I start where I'm just like, I, have these matches and i just kind of want to burn these matches while we talk right yeah so um i got a little piece of water like a cup of water here uh but um to follow paul's opening and offering to i have a feather so i'll start with the feather here first but i uh i uh, i am this is really exciting and um Brian and Elham, thank you so much for thinking about my work and thinking about my, um, uh, including me in this moment. I appreciate it. And uh, so my name, uh, of course, uh, is um, Peter Morin. Uh, I have several names, actually. Uh, sometimes people call me names behind my back, you know, like that's a real thing, right? Um, and that, that's great. I don't want to know those names. But uh, my grandmother gave me the name Azektah when I was either 12, I think 12. Yeah. Uh, Azektah Ushe, that's, that's our name and my name in our language. And uh, I have a full name, uh, Peter Daniel Scott Morin. So my mom did a very good job picking this name. She named me after my father, Pierre Morin, uh, and she named me after her favorite cousin, uh, Danny, Danny Zerza, and she named me after her favorite brother, um, Scott. And she used to say this to me all the time. She would say, pretty darn smart Morin. <laughs> Uh, this is very lucky, you know, and I, I think I do this thing, I do this often where I, you know, I don't think about the history of my work because I'm trained um, in our train. My mother made sure that we were trained in this, the cultural matrix, the cultural practices of our community, the Taltan Nation community. Um, and as I'm speaking from these territories, uh, um, Toronto, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Huron, Wendat, Métis, Inuit, um, the, the the folks of these territories, and speaking about our territory, right? Um, our territory is uh, over three thousand kilometers away from where I am right now, and that's only if you could. Uh, uh, take a direct flight, which you can't. <laughs> I, um, she made sure that I, we worked hard in our culture, and she made sure that we understood that as a helper, like I'm trained as a helper, right? Uh, and, a, and a helper often doesn't um, say what, what they do. 
right? And many indigenous communities, global indigenous communities, we just do the work. You see that there is a need and you do it, right? That also makes it very hard to, you know, like remember, right? And so I just, for today, I, you know, I was at the conference over the past two days and there's just some incredible, incredible people offering voices and offering, making such deep offerings to our collective conversation. And I, I just, um, like, I thought, where have I actually worked? You know, like, where have I actually offered to institutions and organizations? Like, I haven't actually made a, a list ever. <laughs> it's very strange, right? So um, I'm going to try to do that now before I talk about how tomorrow will be different. <laughs> um, and I'm also actually wanted to talk about how tired I feel, you know. Uh, so, you know, of course I went to, I went to art school, I went to Emily Carr, that was a thing that happened. Uh, I worked at Redwire Native Youth Media Society for four years. I worked at the Roundhouse uh, Community Center. I worked with the Britannia Community Center. I worked with Grunt Gallery. I worked with Western Front. I worked with Open Space. These are all beautiful and privileged things you know, privileged spaces. And I want to talk about that. I'll get into that a little bit as well. Just thinking about the offering that I'm trying to make here. Uh, I, worked with, uh, I worked with Salt Spring Women Opposed to Violence and Abuse. I worked with the Victoria Native Friendship Center. I worked with Surrounded by Cedar Child and Family Services. I worked with the Yukon Art Center. I worked with the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, which is now known as the Indigenous Curatorial Collective. I worked um, as the editor of Brunt Magazine. I worked as the, um, I worked at the, at UVic as a sessional instructor. I worked at Camosun College as a sessional instructor. I worked at Brandon University. Um, as a, as a, a um, tenure track uh, assistant professor. Um, and I've worked, I'm working currently with um, the Ontario College of Art and Design University. And in this space, I am, you know, uh, working with the Faculty of Art. I'm the graduate program director of the Interdisciplinary Masters in Art, Media and Design. I never do this. I never do this. I feel a little bit embarrassed doing this. Yeah. Uh, I work as the graduate program director of the interdisciplinary arts, interdisciplinary masters in art, media and design program. And I am the advisor to the provost, uh, the vice president academic on indigenous knowledge practice and production. Um, the entire time, I've probably forgotten a few things, but um, the entire time I have been following what my mom, what my mom taught me. And um, part of that, part of that privilege has been about protecting the knowledge, the Taltan Nation knowledge. but. You know, I've also had such incredible teachers as well along the way. Elders uh, from many nations across the country, folks like Shirley Bear, Iana Miracle, uh, Peter Clare, Cheryl LaRondo, Archer Pachawis, uh, Ahasu, um, uh, folks who have taken the time, Lorna Pawis. <laughs> oh yeah, Bush Gallery, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to that. <laughs> That's a very important part of this story. Um, and um, what I'm curious about and what I'm, you know, wanting to say is that 
two things or three things, three things as an indigenous person working in these institutions, working with community. Uh, Amir Ali Baha'i was the first person to like um, work with me as a curator. Uh, and we had the uh, indigenous events uh, for indigenous day uh, at the roundhouse community center. Um, it was the first time in my life that somebody said to me, well, we're just going to give you $2,500 to do whatever you want. Yeah. And I was like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay artists, um, indigenous artists who didn't go to art school necessarily. Uh, we're going to pay them professional exhibition fees. And then we're going to do workshops on developing um, CDs and writing proposals and writing grants. Um, these things that, uh, you know, become how we uh, jump up, jump scale, like uh, Cree theorist uh, Karen Recolet talks about jumping scale, how you are living on this line and then somehow there's an incident or an event which jumps you up. Yeah. Um, all of this to talk about being tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I was a, been a curator for a while too, but the last curatorial thing I did, really, um, on a major scale, was with the Yukon Art Center, and it was a part of the um, part of the uh, Indigenous Curatorial Collective's annual gathering in Whitehorse. And two things stand out for me there. One of them is that uh, I was told that this was the first time that the entire gallery was uh, dedicated and committed to indigenous artists. That's weird. Yeah. Um, but it happens. Um, and then um, funny it's how it's hard to light matches all of this to say that you know I've had this mo these moments where uh, working in institutions working with institutions I've always felt like I'm collaborating with them and I've I have felt the um, precarity of those collaborations in ways that the institutions have never had to feel right um, we did, Karen Duffick and I worked on something called Peter Morin's Museum. <laughs> um, because what do you need? You need your own museum, you know? You need your own, right? And um, that project was kind of fantastic because uh, what I learned was with Karen, like, so we were co-curators, but I was also the artist. And one of the things that we co-curated was uh, Fred Rowland um, coming and giving a song performance ow, uh, in, the, in the museum. And um, what I learned from that experience with Karen was that the curator or the institution has to be brave and the artist has to be brave. Yeah. And through that bravery, something else could happen we could have Peter Morin's museum, which was actually a, a translation and a teleportation of Taltan Nation territory um, to uh, the satellite gallery uh, in Vancouver. In, uh, uh, at Open Space, which I, in 2009, I, I was working there as artist in residence and I was curator, uh, indigenous curator in residence there as well. Um, Helen Marzoff did this incredible thing for me. Um, she just always said yes. Yeah. And the team there that helped me to, to make um, and contributed to, uh, to the 12 Making Objects, um, AKA First Nations Dada, they also always said yes. And that particular project, um, that particular project uh, was important because um, 
we were tackling the spiritual pain that exists in our body, like tackling is a weird word, right? Uh, we were ta- we were talking about how do how do we re how do we build through the spiritual pain that lives in our collective bodies as a result of the Indian residential schools? And I wasn't specifically just focusing on uh, indigenous people. I was thinking about all of people who call themselves Canadians, uh, new immigrants, um, refugees, uh, folks who come to these territories to understand, to live, right? Um, They always said yes. It was 12 performances over two months. The gallery filled up and was emptied in this process. And I I wanted to say, um, I wanted to say that this leads me to some place, right? How will tomorrow be different? Where did all the light go? You know? Um, and why am I so tired? I learned that um, indigenous knowledge when performed and prioritized within institutions, what happens is things get messy. And often institutions do not want to deal with the messiness. But then there are some institutions that do and are able to. And even though they're not uh, perhaps adequately prepared, they're still able to deal with the uh, what happens as a result of indigenous knowledge being practiced and performed in those spaces. Um, and this also leads me to a recent thing that I, we were working on at OCAD. Uh, you know, um, Dr. Carolyn Langell is the um, vice president academic there. And one of the things that we were able to do is we were able to dream up a floating position within the structure of the institution. Yeah, and the floating position uh, moves around as it needs to move around, right? Uh, And this to, we're out of matches. Uh, This leads to um, kind of an insurgent act within the structure of academia, which, um, which I don't know what will happen. You know, the thing about hiring indigenous people at organizations is also is also that often we're hiring uh, for what we perceive as a gap in the institution. But really what we should be doing is hiring the person and getting the hell out of the way so that they can do their job and provide space for what indigenous knowledge is and practices that, that they are offering to the structure of the institution. Right? Uh, And this leads me to why am I so tired? I feel tired. Yeah. And I think that uh, what I'm also thinking about and feeling about is the, um, what is accountability? And the languages that I'm using at at OCAD in my role as the advisor to the provost is how do we amplify indigenous power? How do we amplify indigenous strength? How do we restore and how do we restore and offer repair to indigenous knowledges, which have been uh, systemically excluded from organizations? OCAD has a history of exclusion of indigenous knowledges as well as other knowledges for over a hundred years. Right? So, and this also leads me to, we need to do planning. And you know, I'm not, sorry, I'm, I'm not doing this work all by myself. I, I'm, you know, there's incredible strength, strength, uh, especially uh, people who are dedicated to these things, right? And some of those folks are in the room with us, you know? Um, it's so dark. Oh, my God. Anyway, <laughs> uh, two things, two things. So um, this also leads me to thinking about the the institutions. You know, if you are implicated and accountable to your history of exclusion of these types of knowledges and practices, then you actually need to start making plans for inclusion, 
for the same amount of time that you've excluded, right? So OCAD is going to be around for another 100 years, right? And so it actually needs to prioritize systemically inclusion of Indigenous knowledge for 100 years, right? Um, but why am I so tired? I, we, I, you know, this sort of like uh, shift uh, uh, of the of of um, the institution, uh, OCAD, for example, also talks about accountability, right? And I think that the more organizations become, the older they get, the further away they they move from the accountability to the bodies of people who actually make it an institution, who actually make it a place. You know, uh, this is something that I shared at the, um, I was uh, doing a cultural and diversity audit of, uh, with a whole bunch of other incredible folks at the McKenzie Art Gallery, right? At some point we lose, that organizations lose their accountability to the actual bodies of people who make them an institution, you know? Um, uh, but why am I so tired? Um, so thinking about what's happening inside of my body and thinking about what's happening inside of my family's body, right? Our, uh, we have, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm moving closer and closer to this because of memory, right? And the question is, how does an institution remember? Like, um, well, they build an archive. <laughs> um, we have a, a gene in our family which leads to, it's called familial Alzheimer's, right? And I, okay, the, sorry, the two, like, last two things. I feel like I'm talking way too much. Um, uh, familial Alzheimer's. So our mom's family sibling group of 15, uh, about seven of them have Alzheimer's and it travels down uh, the family tree, right? So the uh, for institutions uh, and organizations to consider what's actually going on inside of people's bodies and how that how that brings people into the space and allows people to be in the space actually. Um, because eventually I might have Alzheimer's, right? Um, and I want to say that out loud. I want us to start talking about these things, you know, because that is how tomorrow will be different for me. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, I'm going to turn the light on in the room. <laughs> One sec, I'll be right back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Whoa! You. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> I know you don't want to leave, you want to hear the applause. I do, I totally do. <laughs> I get it. I'm a performer. I get it. I'll be right back. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to, to give a bit of a reflection to, for Peter, but just to contextualize the latter half of this convo, we're going to take a quick uh, bio body break. So for folks to get water, to go pee, to get a little snack if they need, um, and we'll, we'll be back at, uh, let's say... 334 um, or 334 Pacific. <laughs> and it is five, it's five minutes. Um, but yes, I just wanted to reflect back, Peter, now that you're here, to the to be unafraid or to take the courage to say it out loud, whatever it is, that by voicing it, by giving it a name, we somehow have an ability to tackle it. Ta your words, tackle. <laughs> in a different way than we did when it was just in the, in the body and not in the space. So thank you. Our conversation where it becomes interactive. Um, five minutes is too short. I know. 
I know. Um, but we're at the end. My dog here wants attention. Um, I'm going to do the thing that Paul hates and open up the Q&A thing here. If I don't it, hate it. I just didn't like to be in that box. <laughs> OK, different artistic interpretations of this. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm only joking. Um, but if, if any folks do have uh, a question, comment, query um, that they want to bring up, they can click that ask a question button and they can be on, on voice. Or you can drop it in the chat or send me a private message and I'll bring it into discussion um, to get the perhaps the ties starting together. Um, I took a lot of notes here because there's a lot to go on, but I think the one that I want to come back to is this this question around memory and how, as you Peter said, like how does an institution remember they build an archive? But to think about perhaps the past three days, we have so much information. We have so much, um, and I think this is what Chris said, like what do you do to to pare it down or what are the methods of entrainment that each of you might use to trickle down what is important as you decide, you know, I have 50 hours of material. Do I have time in my own life to read it, to listen to it? What is that process look like for you in terms of, I guess, you know, the values that guide uh, research practice. I think this was something that also came up in the morning, how, how we embody research. Um, if any of you want to take that away. Joanne? <laughs> I'm trying to get the other guys to do something. <laughs> Look, it's, a, it's a really important question. Um, I think that at this stage in my life and in the situation that we all find ourselves in, um, not just because of the pandemic, I think the pandemic has been a blessing in the sense that we've been all forced to stop and take time. And I think we overcomplicate things. And I think that if you're looking at time and if you're looking at um, memory you you have to at a certain point decide what are the most important things that you want to know and do and i can say as an art historian that my biggest challenge has been to strip my language away I used to be very good at all the language and I, I can barely hear it anymore. I, I find it so upsetting because there are such serious issues that we're dealing with. And let's try to focus on what really counts because I can say for myself that a lot of the time when I was trying to record everybody's clever words, it was about trying to be clever myself, and that wasn't really the important thing in life. And um, if we if we take um, if we take what I call um, my articles of faith, you know, at a certain point around two thousand eight, when I moved to Seattle and in the middle of the economic crisis. And it was, you know, a very serious situation for, for artists and for people. There wasn't any time to mess around. And so the question becomes, what are the single most important things that you need to know and to do? And to be quite ruthless about cutting out all of the surplus, the surplus desires that are confusing the issue. And so I, for me, that's not really the problem anymore because I would only be hoarding it all and keeping it all because I'd want to sound really good and be able to quote a whole part of people. And the hardest thing is to get rid of that um, clever language 
because if you start to think about it, you know, even the question, Brian, that you posed about centre, I don't want to think about it. I've got to be really honest. Uh, I think the last thing we need to be talking about is if there's a centre and where the centre is going to go. You know, so I think for me it's about a level of urgency about what really matters. And you'd be amazed what you can jettison if you, if you decide that's going to be your path. Do you find, Joanne, when you're determining that sense of urgency, I think what ends up getting in the way for both individuals and institution is that fear of getting it right or wanting to get more info before enacting, before doing something. Where where do you go? I have enough. I need I can start acting. Well, my my career has been uh, what I call being a, a serial expatriate. And I, it was very strange for me to move back to Australia for the first time since I was 20. That was where I was born, you know, as I said. And, um, yeah, I, as, as, a, as an expatriate with the responsibility for cultural, for representing, or, or no, for, see, there we are. It's, it's the whole language. It's the language of control. Um, uh, for having certain responsibilities around culture that is not your own and in languages that are not your own. And so one of the things that I learned was I had to go on what I would call my listening tours and I would spend up to six months or a year meeting everybody. And I would find what the consensus was within the community. And I mean, this is why I'm really happy. I'm generally happy to be part of this process because that's, that's what you're doing, you're listening. And um, if, you, if you listen and you find out what are the, really the, the, the one, two or three things that are the single most important to address in the life of the country, and I mean, the land, the country, the state, the nation, and the people who are in it, and you decide that's what you have to focus on. And that can be, for me, it's it's the moment that we're in right now. And, and I just for me, I, I mean, I know it sounds overly simplistic, everything else is secondary. So... I think it, it gives, you can have a razor sharp um, perspective or clarity about what it is you have to do if you're not worried about being right. I've been so wrong so many times and I have to, I have to, you know, just take it. And, and I've, I've lived, since I've been in my 20s, I've lived in the public eye. And there's always somebody who's mad at what you're doing. <laughs> and so you have to you have to swallow it and you have to make sure that if you do something really terrible, you never do it again. And that's it. It's it's a lot simpler than it seems if you know what counts. I think that's so true. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Joanne, for that. And I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know when I, I don't know why I thought our mom would be able to remember forever. Yeah, and she had an incredible kind of um, ability to know all of the family trees of the entire community, right? Uh, and so when she was letting me know who I'm related to, I was like, well, she'll be here forever, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then part of it is what, like, I totally agree. Like, you have to be open to how the value systems change, you know. Um, I also don't know why I, I thought the land, like Taltan territory, would remember forever. 
right? There was a specific uh, village, the first village site, where after all of, after all Taltan people were like forced into the reserve or whatever, buildings there, like I took my, or we took our grandma there, you know, she, we, we stood in front of the house where she was born, you know, there was a church there um, built over a hundred years ago, right? And then two, year, two years ago, there was a, an incredible fire and it all burned mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. right? And so knowing what the, val the actual value systems that you want to move forward with, but being aware that things got to change, things got to shift inside of you as the practitioner, as well as the, what you perceive the institutional structure to be. Mm. Yeah. Paul, is that a... Um, yeah, sometimes you have to forget. Sometimes it's essential to forget because the memory is false or because the memory is a, is, is a oppressive in, in it, or perhaps you have to you have to change your way of remembering so that there's some openness for other memories to come in um you know uh and i say that recognizing that you know colonial culture has been very um has con very conveniently forgotten a lot of things um so i'm not talking about that kind of convenient forgetting i'm talking about a the most inconvenient kind of forgetting of forgetting what what you think you know as your power and your right so that other powers and other rights have a place to enter i mean sometimes forgetting can be good you know if an, if, an, if uh sometimes if you don't remember something that the institution has done that is bad perhaps you can approach it in a fresh way that will be good as opposed to only only coming from a position of guilt, for example. Um, but one still has responsibility even for those things. So it's, it's a very complex issue. Um, maybe I can speak a little bit about, um, I, I recent, I've been working on a series called PSDC, uh, which I'm doing under the auspices of the Toronto Performance Art Collective, which is the collective that runs the 7A 11th Festival. And um, one of the artists I work with was an artist who I'd worked with many times. Uh, we had a, a strong personal friendship bond. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I thought I really knew what I was doing as an organizer. I've been several, like, at least three decades of organizers. And I really blew it that relationship really went sour. It was a really difficult, terrible project for both of us. Um, hopefully not for the participants or people who experienced the event. But um, uh, there were a lot of things I thought I knew that, that I realized I needed to put aside in terms of imagining that the relationship would be the same. Um, that artist treated me as the as an institution as opposed to as and I thought we were we were colleagues working together, but I I was I was being the institute I I was put in the role of being the institution in that moment. And, which for me is ridiculous because 7A 11 D is a collective that's not that tries not to be an institution but that has because because it is seen as an institution has responsibilities as an institution this goes back to what i was saying earlier the institution is its own thing we have personal responsibilities for but in that moment i was the avatar of the institution and therefore was the institution or the artist and i didn't know how to forget the relationship I thought we were having to have the relationship that we were having, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Paul. 
Joanne, I'm just getting a bit of feedback from your mic. So when you're not on mic, I'm just going to have you muted if that's OK. Oh, sorry about that. OK. That's all right. It's technology. Yeah, it's, it keeps going on. <laughs> it doesn't It doesn't want to stay off. It wants to hear I'm you. I'm trouble getting it off. <laughs> um, Do you want to? There you go. Um, so when we talk about, let's say we've listened, and then going back to what you brought up in your your speech, Joanne, when we're then told after we've done all this work by funders that our work, our programming, our bodies, our thoughts are not of significance, how how does one respond? Is it do you protest, revolt, wait? What is um, what is the motion for you as either individuals or as institutions when you have a path to forge ahead on and you're you're met with challenge? Nothing's going to stop me. You know, it's that straightforward. And I must say, in this case, you know, it was my first exhibition. So, you know, I didn't have a lot of clout. But um, uh, Luke Rombaugh, who was the director, he just got mad and we got mad and we decided there was absolutely no way that this project was not going to happen and that it was much more important. So we moved funding inside the museum, cannibalised, you know, other, other, other projects. We had, as I mentioned, fantastic help from, other, from colleagues, from colleagues that made it happen and took over all sorts of responsibilities. But I must say that there are, there are things that you have to do and it doesn't matter who tries to stop you, you're going to do it. And that's when, that's when you know that something is larger than yourself and more important than yourself and you just have to make the sacrifices. And yes, I got, I got mad and Luke, um, did it publicly, very publicly, and was criticised for being so indiscreet as to attack the country's major funder in writing forever and embarrass everybody. But I think you also have to call out when there are... This is, this is not just about, oh, you know, my project's important and therefore I have to get money. This was something that was really larger than just any individual and had to be done. And so I guess in a certain way, I, I become like a train, you know, if you can't, you can't stop me, I'll find a way to do it. And even if I have to wait till I get another job, I'll do it. That's it. And and same uh, question to Peter or Paul. <laughs> it's funny how we just followed in, like we're following the format of the screen too, hey? It's, <laughs> it's the institutional structures are, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> I love it, I kind of, I, uh, you know what? I, I just have never had a choice. You know, I, you know, the moment I take a, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? But I'm just like, I want indigenous youth to know that the art gallery belongs to them. You know, that's part of the work that we did. You know, Doug Jarvis and I did uh, with um, Ellie Dion, Bonnie Quaite, Sarah Hunt at, at uh, Open Space. You know, uh, I want I want indigenous students to know that the, they already have a master's. Like they don't have to like worry about it you know like the masters already belongs to them you know so i'm going to develop language so that i can communicate that well to community members um yeah yeah this is word masters it's weird it's a you know all this kind of stuff but you already have this you this is yours you know um and i'm gonna you know work with folks in the institution and collaborate with them to change the language of the supervisory team so that elders can be 
on the supervisory team as a primary or secondary advisor or as you know a, a supplementary advisor you know so these are things we've been we're you're doing nobody told me like you know f you know like hard work to get into the room right and working with so many incredible people in in kinship networks and relational networks and you know so i'm not in this room by myself you know uh but then what i learned after becoming an agent of the institution like a real deep agent now like I, that's what i am right i'm a i'm not even a secret agent man you know what i mean or a secret agent person um nobody told me you have to fight hard to stay in the room you know and how much work that actually is um yeah paul <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, according to my resume, I've started two institutions, <laughs> FOTO and 7A11D. Um, they didn't start off as I'm starting an institution. They were just doings and they weren't things I did on my own. And, you know, I am a co-founder of those things. Um, what I do has always been about uh, for myself and for others who I imagine might be like me of like, well, I see this thing, either it's something I see that no one else is that's in the room that like the white elephant, no one's talking about, or whether it's uh, a, a, a glimmering of possibility, um, you know, and at a certain point you realize no one else is acknowledging that thing. So I'm going to acknowledge it just, just because maybe one, someone will see it and go, oh, you see that too? You know, so that I'm not alone, so that they're not alone, so that we're not alone. Um, and, and I realized over a lot of heartache that, that part of that process is also trying to um, attenuate myself or detune myself in ways that I can also then, you know, have space for when other people show me what they see or what they imagine. And, you know, that those are, those are two, they're interrelated, they're simultaneous interwoven processes that, um, that I'm always thinking about as a performance artist, as an organizer, and I guess as a theorist as well of, of, of you know, um, what are those, what are those, I, I'm interested in all the things that we're not all acknowledging as a group yet. And how can we, how can we find others who acknowledge those things so that they can take their place? If, if I can just add something, Brian, to this, I've been thinking about it, you know, as, as, as the two of you have been speaking. One of the things I learned, you know, the truck approach or the train approach doesn't always work. It can be a little bit alienating. Um, but over time, I found that it's some, sometimes you, you have to... You really have to work on, on, on a lateral level. And for example, you know, coming back to the situation in Seattle, where it, it was just dreadful. I, I mean, there was literally no funding for artists and really quite famous people. I knew they were sleeping on their friend's couch. They didn't have, they were homeless. But all of a sudden, people who, you know, uh, artists, tend to live on the margins anyway. But I don't think outside of the States, people really realized um, just how devastating the economic crisis was because there was no backup. There wasn't anywhere to go. And so sometimes the, the great lessons, you know, my time in Seattle was, was a, a, a learning situation for me in two, in, in two key 
two key ways. One is, again, if you, if you come down to the core question, which is how are artists going to get a bed and food, then you have to shift your you have to shift what you do away from putting on an exhibition, which is nice, but of relatively little value to the artist, ultimately. Because it's, you know, there's a myth of the market that, you know, the more exhibitions you have, the more you can sell and the better you do. But in fact, um, often artists are supporting institutions to put on their show. So the best thing that I realised I could do was to commission work because commissioning work meant that the artists at the end had something to sell and they were given money and there was a there was an understanding that if they did the work you know so sometimes a lot of production and they're very ambitious projects so that if uh, almost all the budget got moved over to 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 finding ways to give artists money to live and the other thing that happened was that it wasn't any um, there wasn't any use in going to either the city of Seattle or, or even the state of Washington to try to get money because they didn't have any. And we ended up creating a completely new way of funding through a foundation that supported people in need, homelessness and need. And when they understood that artists were living so living on, on, you know so close to homelessness, they came in and funded these commissions for a you know five year period. So in other words, again, it, it's like focusing on the problem. What is, what is the issue, or, or not even the problem? What are the important things in life? Trying to contribute in some way to ameliorating the issues and then you find new ways of doing things. I think that's also something that, that you know I learned out of being in the States is because people just they just do it, they just get things done. You know, there there isn't the safety network that uh, we rely on in Canada, and therefore um, you have to be strong and, and you have to be flexible in terms of how you think you're going to survive. Thanks, Joanne. Um, I'm just going to amplify some of the things happening in the chat. Irene says, um, regarding other knowledge and people with Alzheimer's. Uh, at the moment, I don't feel there's any institutional support or accommodation for even the common problem of brain fog for women artists going through menopause. So I don't know how the institution will make that leap effectively when it refuses to even address unfair work conditions for contract workers. But I hope for a more equitable future. Also, thank you, Peter. I admire your work. Um, I, I want to come back. I have kind of one uh, bigger question before we're, we're come to a close for the panel. And it's coming back to something that you brought up, Paul, around the position of self versus position of self as institution. And also something you said in your, your uh, speech earlier of who do we want to have access. And I feel like this is sometimes at odds from institutional to personal. Institutions tend to think broad and general. Oh, well, we want everyone to have access. We want everyone to be there. Um, okay, um, well, get more specific. So this elimination process, which can sometimes seem kind of exclusionary, is actually necessary to figuring out who it is we want to speak to or with. And I'm borrowing this kind of paraphrased idea a bit from Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, where she talks about thoughtful exclusion as part of building effective and generative gatherings. So how do you think of this in relation to self and institution or institution as self? So where you are in part 
as a person, Joanne, Peter, Paul, defining the guiding principles of something much larger than yourself. And yet it still threads back to you as catalyst, instigator, patriarch, matriarch of that care. Do you try to remove yourself from the institution and the values that it crafts, or are you actively letting it seep into the work? So I, I'm really just trying to get at this distinction between Paul is 7A11D, Peter is OCAD U. And again, you know, I, I also don't want to lean too hard into a binary, but these do emerge in both public and private perception of institution and and of of each of you as artists and how I'm how you particularly navigate something that you can you can't really turn off and on uh, at will. Big question. Yeah, I can start on that one just to shake it up a bit. Um, <laughs> uh, so as one of the artists who started FADO, I ran that organization for 14 years. And there was a point where people were saying, well, you are FADO. And I knew I wasn't. And the only way I could sort of prove that to the world and being me, of course, it was right at the point where I had finally gotten the institution to a point where there was enough money coming into that, that entity that it could pay a person a living wage, I left. It took 14 months to do the transition because people thought, oh, Paul is Fado. And we're now, it's funny because we're now exactly at the point where Fado, I have not been involved with Fado for as long as I was involved with Fado because it's like 28 years old now and I ran it for the first 14 years. Um, I had to step away from it. And, you know, as I said, we did a 14 month transition and it, it was, painful because you know we did one of those sort of sounding sessions and we brought in a professional judy wolf who talked to us about where the institution wanted to be and one of the things she said was well the organizations uh, that are successful when the when the founder steps down they have to leave completely in order for the organization to be successful i don't know if that's true but i decided that i didn't want to risk it because it was always important to me that this thing was a community resource. It wasn't me, it wasn't, I mean, it, it was in many ways my, you know, the thing that supported my curatorial habit. <laughs> um, but I always saw it as a community resource first. And so I thought, okay, I have to leave and I have to leave completely because I want to know that 14 years from now, I can look and say, oh, look, that organization is still running and it is. so. So for better or for worse, that decision worked. Um, 7A, 11D is a completely different kind of institution because it's a collective. Uh, there's no operational money. It's all project money. Um, there's no paid staff. We're all volunteers who do it. That creates a certain kind of limitation of access in terms of, so who could be on that collective when it's all volunteer unpaid labor, right? I mean, that's held us back from including people who we would like to be a part of the collective who can't be. And so we have to think about things like, okay, how can we find money to pay that person to come and independent and, and curate something for the organization without necessarily becoming a collective member because they need that income in order to do that work. Um, uh, these are the kinds of questions that get determined by how you decide you're an organization or you're not an organization, how, how much it is your individual project, what it means to be an institution with a public face, what those best practices are as an institution as opposed to the best practices of you as a friend, as a colleague, as an individual, as a curator. All of these, all of these relationships happen at the same time. That's why I was saying, in that little field guide that I'm creating, uh, which, by the way, is 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 a suggestion of it of a different possibility of a future. Because now I'm invested in that idea of a field guide, and I want to go forward and start creating what this is very much a kernel of of 
okay, what will that field guide be? So, so now live has had this other effect that, oh, they've inspired somebody who's going to go off and create this other thing now without it being part of their main programming. Um, so that's, that's another thing that is always happening simultaneously. I know I'm cramming a lot in here, but, um, but we are so many different relationalities at once. And so, um, and some we can be, some we are conscious of at any one time and, and, and paying attention to in, in a kind of very focused, uh, way of taking responsibility some we cannot take responsibility for and they're just happening and there's nothing you can do about them and you know uh, i don't know if it's like aa where you have to have the like you know grant me the wisdom to to know what i can change and know what i can't and you know that whole process of like what can i be responsible for and 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 the wisdom to know what i'm not responsible for uh you know uh those are questions that you constantly have to reanimate in in i think in yourself throughout your career in the same way joanna saying i had to unlearn everything i didn't learn all these things that all this language this wonderful language i accrued of my ability to say something and and then and then at a certain point you then have to unlearn all of that which is a which is a deep painful process and and you know it appears that that's something live is attempting to do in its own way with this assembly as part of that process and and you know as i said there's no answers only questions so i can point to the process but i i don't have an answer for you brian sorry <laughs> damn you <laughs> Where where are those answers? Hey, <laughs> I um you know I, I have a I have a lot of privilege in my life. Um, I have a lot of people who I love uh, and who have uh, let me know that they love me uh, and that they have shared so deeply with me. Um, I think that's part of my part of my answer. Uh, part of my answer. <laughs> it's not an answer. It's part of an answer. Um, I'm an uncle to some incredible uh, nieces and nephews. Um, and I work hard for them. Right. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, I got this, you know, cool job now. Uh, I think it's partly because I'm a loud mouth and Taltan Nation people are loud people. Like, uh, but I am not doing my job if I'm not making space and opening up space and including people who are unimagined in those environments, um, in, including knowledge practice and production or artistic practice and production. Indigenous art history is over 10,000 years old in these territories, you know, like the original art schools, right? So, um, I also, you know, because I want the world to be a better place for my nieces and nephews, I, I thought I want to be the person who teaches the teachers in art school, right? So that I can be in the front of the room and, and, uh, and share just my experience, right? Like uh, the decolonial methodology is a possibility and it opens up a po unimagined possibilities. Um, decolonizing methodologies uh, help me to, to, I mean, besides my, my mom, Janelle, her name is Janelle, uh, what she teaches me every day um, when I'm with her or when I'm away from her, um, but I absolutely refuse to see her body, her practice in, a, in a, any deficiency at all. Right. And so that also keeps me uh, present in the room. And uh, I think it actually amplifies my voice a little bit more than uh, I, you know, probably should. But, um, you know, I want to be the person, you know, because these folks in the master's program, they might go and teach at art schools. Right. And I, IAMD program is there is so much global ancestry 
in the room in that program, right? Which is such a privilege to stand with and be with and think alongside of. So I want to be that person who says indigenous knowledge is here. Indigenous knowledge is this. This is, you know, a strategy for not exploiting it and exploiting the bodies uh, or producers of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that I've learned also how to get out of the way, you know, <laughs> uh, for the next generations to step up and do their work too and make their contributions, right? So, um, yeah, not an answer. <laughs> Part of an answer. <laughs> Joanne, any response from you? I, I can't speak. I can't. Can you? Un oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, I wouldn't want to add anything to what you both said. You know, I think that um, uh, people who have worked in institutions such as I have are often institutionalized in the way people look look at you or even react to you. And I think what we've been hearing um, is, uh, uh, um, is about love. And I, you, you, I couldn't stay, I couldn't have stayed in this field for this long without having um, those enormous love for the artist or for the the ideas and and for the people that I've met. I, I mean my life has been so enriched and then it then it comes back to how can you support that? Because it's it's a um, it's it's a very special, very wonderful field or fields because there's, there's nothing singular that's a very western notion there's a field there isn't one and uh so in these multiple worlds and languages and and crack and I, I don't want to use the word practice right so in this world that i that i, I find myself i am both uh, filled with love for it and receiving love and I think it's the most important aspect of what we do. And it's when you talk, Peter, about being tired, you'd just be far too tired if there wasn't any love in it. <laughs> uh, thank you all, Paul, Peter, and Joanne, for answering that tough question and, and the, all the other contributions you've made for this discussion. It's it's the end. It's this is the it. This is it for the assembly. Um, I have to give some space for our um, intrepid uh, lead curator Alham to come back on and uh, do a final goodbye and all of our thank yous and wrap up. But um, thank you all three for such a great uh, discussion and your really great preparations and improvised happenings by just you know being present yes yeah time for applause <laughs>
I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation to all participants, Dave Beach, John Bernie Dunsker, Paul Polyar, Chris Creighton Kelly, Margaret Drago and her friends, wonderful friends, Snezana Golovovich, Jean Van Hispy, Maria Haliova, Doug Jervis, Peter Morin, Paul Anil, Monica Narula, Erit Rubuf, Dina Warren, Ariel Sande Cardinal, Jay Cardinal, Chipo Chipaziwa, James Albers, Rico Inoi, Pegata Bazinejad, Fausto Grossi, Richard White, and of course, Senequala Wise. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experiences with us. On the final day of live assembly, repair and care, we see ourselves still in the research and continue to ask ourselves this question again and again, for whom are we building future organizations? And what is it that we need to learn on the way? Before we finish, I would like I would also like to acknowledge our wonderful moderators, Sisi Fu, Guadalupe Martinez, and Brian Postalian. And also our great curatorial team for their hard work and dedication. Ella Chan, Doug Jervis, Yelan Luis, Brady Steel Marks, Leon Pinen, Brian Postalian, Ian Francis, and Yavin Dari Kalova. Thanks to everyone for for coming to the three days and your contribution to the live assembly. Have a great evening and please share your thoughts with us through the live platform designed by Brady CL Marks in collaboration with Caleb Chan. We appreciate your ongoing contribution. And it, uh, it goes without saying thank you, Elham, for all of your work um, bringing all these people together. <laughs> Big thanks to Elham as well. She should get her own applause. Yes. <laughs> Again, thanks Joanne, Peter, and Paul. And thank you all of you who have been coming out for today and not the other three days.